Good morning. It always takes me a moment to recover from the children fleeing at my side. It's, 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 it's a blow each Sunday that they run for the, the uh, doors. If you're visiting, we're just really glad that you uh, got your car started and, and got out in this cold, and we really uh, hope that already you've heard God's voice uh, speaking. But my name is Pastor Bill Greiner, and it's, a, it's an honor to serve here at Eagle Ridge. And I'm particularly excited about the series that we're in. Um, we're, we're, this, we're calling this series Discipleship Gospel. And we know that those, both of those words have a lot of different thoughts that we have. And we're really trying to nail down what Scripture says is gospel. Because we have a lot of opinions about that. It's really important that we're on the same page with that. And Scripture is, is clear. and we're, we're going through that. But there's also this connection between a full, complete gospel and a call to discipleship. That's what the arrows connecting those two are about. And so that's what we're doing uh, during this, this uh, winter season. And it's, a, uh, it's all connected. The sermons on Sunday morning, uh, this book called The Discipleship Gospel. I always turn it this way so you'll know, not intimidating, small. Remember, kids, that's why we chose Lord of the Flies because it was thin, remember? Because there was other, those other big ones that you could have chosen uh, to read. But uh, it's a book, it's a sermon series, but it's also our small groups we call bridge groups uh, that are meeting throughout the week. It's definitely not too late to jump into one of those, and actually there's some starting each Sunday morning. And they're discussing the same thing, so everything is connected. We believe God can do something powerful when we're focused uh, as God's people uh, listening to his voice. Um, but... Last week, we gave kind of a, a 30,000-foot flyover of the, the, the main points of what the Scripture calls the gospel, Jesus' gospel. And on the left, you've got some what we call declarative statements. These are the truth statements. There's the kingdom that Jesus came to, to speak and announce. He was the Christ, his death and resurrection. Those are the facts. But the facts aren't enough. The facts demand a response. The imperative res- are responses. Our response to kingdom, Christ, death, and resurrection are to repent, change direction, to believe, believe in, not just to, to believe that it is true, believe enough to trust, and then to follow. And so that's kind of where we're heading. That's the path for this series. And this morning, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, one of these first declarative statements, these statements about who Jesus was and what he came to accomplish. The imperatives are our response to who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. And, and we're going to be talking about the kingdom today. And uh, I, I'm aware that in, in, in the American church, you could, you could come to a, a lot of church services and not hear um, a, a sermon directly about the kingdom. And um, that's unusual, that's strange, because it's something that Jesus talked about so often. We mentioned this uh, several times. Jesus spoke about the kingdom over 100 times. So we hear these phrases, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Those are interchangeable. And we just kind of skip over those. We have a tendency, well, that's talking about, you know, uh, the future, right? Let's pump the brakes on that. We'll we'll get get to what Scripture is talking about here. But how can you have a gospel the heart of what Jesus was about and what he was saying and not have it about the kingdom if it's something he spoke about over 100 times. So why this aspect of the gospel first? Why are we hitting this one first? If you've been around here, you've already heard some of the hints of why we're doing this. Jesus spoke for two years almost exclusively about the kingdom. He didn't talk about how he was the Christ. He didn't talk about his death, and he didn't talk about his resurrection. For two whole years, he just talked about the kingdom before he said who he was. When we introduce ourselves immediately, we we start talking about who we are, so they kind of get a feel. No, Jesus just started talking about the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom is where Jesus started, so that's probably where we should start, right? If If that isn't enough for you, Starting with the kingdom and Jesus as king, all those other things, him being the Christ, his death and resurrection, and those responses, they all fall into place 
if there's a kingdom and a king. That's kind of an umbrella over the whole thing, right? The others make sense because he's a king and he has a kingdom. And then, of course, my brother, we talked about this last time, there's this verse. And there's an outline in your, in your worship folders. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Or you might have heard it or read it, seek ye first the kingdom. And live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So Jesus uh, said it a hundred times. He spoke two years about it. Um, he's a king and that makes sense with everything. And then he says, before we, uh, bef- before we seek what I need before I seek my sins to be forgiven, before I seek for hope, direction, purpose, love, and shelter, and food, before all of those things, I'm supposed to seek the kingdom. So how in the world, how can you possibly talk about the gospel without talking about the kingdom? Well, you can't. They're, they're inseparable. There are two ways that we, we are going to, two terms that we are going to throw out for the gospel, how we're going to qualify the word gospel. One of them is a discipleship gospel, a gospel that demands following, repentance, and, and believing. But also, you can also call it a kingdom gospel. You can also, also call it that. Discipleship is, is, if Jesus is all those things we say is, following him makes perfect sense. And when we talked about all of the half gospels that, that are promoted in, in the U.S., always leave out discipleship. Someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus and committed to Jesus' mission. That's always what's left out. And what we've already talked about is the idea of the kingdom is left out all the time. We just kind of lop it off and say, well, let's talk about the future. So we're, it, it, it's, a little, it's a little awkward for us to put kingdom and gospel together. But we're going we're gonna to do that today because where you're going to hear later, Jesus says it straight out. That's what he calls it. Here's straight from the author's mouth. This is the verse. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. <laughs> he puts it right together. Good news is gospel. It's the same. The gospel of the kingdom of God in other towns too because that's why I was sent. Drop the mic, walk out of the room. The gospel is about the kingdom. It, the kingdom is, is the beginning of the gospel and it's the end. So if we don't get, if we, if, if we lop this one off, we got nothing. We've got no king, we've got no authority, we've got nothing. Here's a definition, if you want a, a working definition for the idea of the kingdom of God. Uh, we've shared this earlier, but I want to put it in your notes again. The kingdom of God is the restoration of God's rule over all things you're taking notes, if you want to circle all things, all things, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. So how did, how did God's rule over all things start before it needed to be restored? Because if something needs to be restored, that means it was full and then now it's not. Okay? How did that get started? I lopped together a bunch of verses from, from Genesis in the beginning, okay? Which conveniently, that's what Genesis means in the beginning perfect. So if you see dot, 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 I, I'm not leaving. I just wanted to get some of the some statements here. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Let, the, let lights appear in the sky and separate the day from the night. Let them, uh, let them be a sign to mark the seasons, days and years. Let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds every, of every kind. Let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. They will reign, or you could say dominion, that's another word for that, over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth and small animals that scurry along uh, the ground. This is how God's authority started. Did, did you notice that the, uh, the beginning, that let there be light and all those other things are in quotes? God is speaking and then something is coming into being. That's what kings do. They pronounce something, and it happens, right? There's, a, there's a, one of the few Latin terms I remember from seminary. They gave me a lot of them, but I remember one. Um, it's ex nihilo, out of nothing. God created everything out of nothing. He didn't need raw material. 
He spoke it, and then it happened. That's a king, right? That, that's a king, and that's a kingdom. When, when you have the authority to speak, and stuff happens. He didn't take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, no, he spoke, and it happened, and those things were made. And he, yet he gave us the right to reign or have a dominion underneath him. There's no fuzziness about who the king was. He's put us some, in some charge of some things that he, that he made. So what does Jesus have to do with this kingdom that, that started in the beginning and uh, God's over everything? He spoke everything in existence. If you were here this summer, this is going to sound very familiar. This is from Colossians. Christ is the visible... If, as I'm going through this, if you, you see phrases about who Jesus is, and you're, if you're a note-taker, just circle them. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realm, realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is the first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and in earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Wow. It kind of tells you Jesus. That's so important. I mean, that, this, is, this is cash money. This is, this is a big Jesus who is a king. I mean, it's like I would like to tattoo this on my arm, but my arm's too scrawny, and that is a really long verse. This is important stuff, okay? This is huge. This is how Jesus fits in. He was in the beginning. He created. He was involved in created, and it says he holds it together. It belongs to him, and he holds it all together. That's how Jesus... So it started, God's rule over everything. He put the... And it, another verse says he put everything under Jesus' feet. So he's in charge of all this. This is huge. This describes in HD that Jesus is king and has a kingdom, and that is over heaven and earth. His authority is not questioned. We're going to get to the rest of what needs to be restored in a minute. This is flyover of the whole story of the Bible in, in, a, in a few moments. It's huge. So why does it need to be restored? Here's why. This is from Romans. Yes, Adam, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one, person, one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's love was given so that all people could see how sinful they were, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. And just as sin ruled over all people and brought them de to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead by giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there's a lot in there, but you, you see how things fell apart. Why something needs to be restored. It, that one phrase, just as sin ruled over all people and brought death. Sin brought death into the world. That separation from God. That hiding from him in the garden, that whole thing. See, creation isn't as it should be because God allowed those who he put under him to choose to respond to his loving rule or not. That's where the restoration needs, and many chose not. For a time, he allows his rule to be compromised while still remaining sovereign. He knows where this is going. He knows his kingdom is, going, is, is being is going to be completely restored. 
to in the beginning where he spoke and things happened. It just, it just became. But sin brought that death into the world. It is God's grace that he is patient during the in-between time so that people can, can enter into his kingdom. Did you see that? There are two phrases, right relationship and right standing. Did you see that? Notice that language in there. Well, let me ask you a question. What's the right standing posture or relationship in front of a king who all, has all authority? It's to submit and come under his loving rule. So that's what Jesus came to do, is bring us back into a right standing where we understand that he's a king. And this isn't a cute metaphor for something. No, it's a, it's a reality. We'll get to that later. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is the beginning and the end of the gospel. Is that Jesus, the rain, sin, brought death and separation. And now, God's loving rule over everything is being restored. Okay? That's a, whole lot of, that's a whole lot of Bible in a short period of time, okay? But it's very simple. He had complete authority. Uh, Jesus is the one he put it under. Uh, sin brought death and separation. Now we're in a period of restoration. And what they say about uh, renovations and respira- restorations, they always cost more and last longer than you thought. The easier to build another house, right? Just knock the thing over and build another one. Because it always takes longer. It takes longer because he's patient. That's why it takes longer. Here's what happens when the restoration is complete. In Philippians, therefore God elevated him, Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above other, of all other names, that, all, that, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. That's the right relationship, the right posture. And every tongue will declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord is another way to, to state unquestioned authority. So there it is. This is where it's heading. In the kingdom now, we get an opportunity to be part of the restoration because we willingly bow and confess or bow and declare. When Jesus comes back, the the they're no longer, there's no longer a option for bowing and for confessing or agreeing with. When he comes back, it will be completely restored and it will be back to where when God speaks, it happens. Period. His patience, he's waited. Now everything is brought together. The kingdom is, that's why the kingdom is, is, is so amazing. It's already, but at the same time, it's not yet. It's already, but it's not yet. Now, it may not look like the kingdom is, is, uh, is moving. It, it may not look like the kingdom's being restored because things look kind of a mess, right, in the world in general. I, I, I'm not saying anything particularly shocking there, am I? <laughs> but that's because of his patience. It's being restored. Now let's get back to that connection between kingdom and gospel. It sounds like an awkward fit, but remember, let's re- review. Jesus spoke first about the kingdom. He asked us to seek it first, so it's first. And it is the umbrella over all the other things that are part of the gospel. If there's no kingdom and there's no king, none of that other stuff makes any sense. It's just random details that, are, that have no order. Here's what, from, uh, from the book we've been reading, the Discipleship Gospel, the author Bill Hull writes this on uh, page 53. As we communicate the gospel, there's a dire need to help people understand that when they believe in the gospel of Jesus, they are stepping into something far bigger than themselves. They're entering into something God established from the beginning of time in Genesis, something that Christ unleashed with power through his life, death, and resurrection, something God will complete in fullness at the end of time with Christ's second coming and something that Christ will reign over as king for all eternity, the kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom of God. 
We can't, we can't present a gospel that doesn't have the kingdom of God or it's not legitimate. And again, even if it's half of it is true, half of the directions don't get you your, to where you need to go. You need the whole thing. And without the kingdom, we got nothing. We've, we've got, a, we've got a, a, a house of cards. We've got a straw man. We've got whatever metaphor you want to use for that. See, if we understand the kingdom properly as the beginning of the gospel, here's some important parts that can help that all come together. We've been dancing around all of these. It's first, it is a present reality. It's already, but not yet. It is a present reality. Jesus wasn't just talking about the future in heaven and the new creation. He said this, The time promised by God has come at last. He announced, The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. See, like I said, there's a temptation to read through scripture and every time we see kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, again, interchangeable phrases, we immediately lop in, that means our heavenly reward. Present reality, it's now, but not yet, it's future. Yes, that's part of it. But to lop all that off and say that's just about our heavenly reward, there's some real problem with that kind of thinking. Because then stuff that's going on around here just really doesn't matter anymore. And when I read about Jesus, the stuff that was happening around him, that mattered. It was important. You know, the temptation to to lop those things off and just think about their future reward after death is, is to miss the already. It is near. I came to announce something. Boom, it starts with me. Talking about Jesus, not Bill. If you got confused there for a second, I was saying me, but we, we understand what we're talking about here. The kingdom is pre- a present reality, it is already. That's the part of the phrase. Listen to this from Matthew. The kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom now is wherever God's will is happening. The, when stuff is happening here, that's happening there, that's, that's the kingdom. So now we're back to that problem. If, if the kingdom is only heaven, then, then all, that, all it's about is getting as many people off this sinking ship because everything here is garbage and it's a sinking ship and we just have to get people off of it. That's not what that verse says. It says the kingdom is now. Yes, it's in the future too, in full effect but it is happening right now. Present reality, future hope, all at the same time. Do I completely understand that? Absolutely not. When God's will is done in any way in this world, that is the kingdom. God's loving rule being restored. That's what that is. See, it's not just a present reality. It's, it's also, it is moving forward and expanding. The kingdom of God is moving forward. It is not static. It's not like a fact. It's something that's moving. It's, it's alive and breathing. Let's look at the definition again. The kingdom of God is the restoration of God's rule over all things. Restoration means something is moving forward. The restoration is kind of a, the idea of, of taking something back. Again, restoring a... a be- Am I there? There, I'm I'm back. Okay. It's like restoring a beautiful Victorian house. It's a mess, but you see there's something awesome there. And you take the time to restore it. And then then you've got something that uh, is amazing. It's also like the idea of retaking ground that a wicked enemy has taken from you. Our, our uh, uh, leader of uh, the Church of God in Anderson, of, over all of our ministries, he always says, says the phrase, taking back what hell has stolen. That's restoration. When hell has stolen something and, and the kingdom t- it, it, it is taken back for God, that's restoration of his kingdom. Listen to this from Acts. For he must remain in heaven until the time of the final restoration of all things. As God promised long ago 
through his Holy Spirit. This is moving forward, but there will be a point where it won't need to be moving forward, where it will, bam, it will be in full effect. Back to Genesis, where God's rule, his loving, benevolent rule is such that he speaks it and it happens over all of everything, over all of creation. And again, don't, get, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying God's sovereign. No, he's sovereign because he's in control of it. And it's his patience that allows him to wait. His patience is based on his love for us. So this is something that's, that's, that's moving forward. So the kingdom of God is the beginning of the gospel. It is the end of the gospel. It is a present reality, but it's also something that's moving forward and expanding. It's not static. The, the final part of this, that I, these couple of things that can help us really get a handle on what the kingdom is, is this. It exists wherever God's loving rule through Christ is acknowledged. And after I picked that word acknowledged, I thought that's not really strong enough. You could put acknowledged and submitted to. I see it, and I'm going to come under it because it's real. This is the already but not yet time that we live in right now. Where, wherever God's loving rule through Christ is acknowledged, that's, that's the kingdom. So we get to see in the in-between time, the already but not yet, in the in-between time, we get to see signs of his kingdom expanding, moving forward, being restored. Um, my boss over in, in Alma, uh, Steve Wimmer, he used to say we get to see flashes of the kingdom that we will see in full effect when he returns. We, we get to see, like, wow, look at that. That was, that was God's kingdom. We get to see flashes of what is 24-7 in heaven. Well, actually not 24-7 because there's no time in heaven, but you get what I'm saying, right? Complete. Here are some examples of signs of the kingdom as a present reality, as moving forward, as God's loving rule being restored. Listen to this. The kingdom is present in the message of the gospel. Yes, you are experiencing and we are experiencing the kingdom right now. Not because I'm awesome, but because the gospel is being presented. This kingdom defies all authorities. When we speak these things, it defies other authorities. It punches them right in the face. It screams out against sin and death and what it has caused when the gospel is presented. This, is a, this morning is a sign of the kingdom. See, what we are talking about here is subversive as its very nature, the kingdom of God. It's something that is real, but, but folk can't see it. When the gospel is presented in all its fullness and beauty, stuff starts moving. Things start happening. And do not hear what I'm not saying. I'm not just saying when some professional presents it in front of a group. No, no, no. When the gospel is, comes out of anybody's mouth or off of words, off of a page to somebody, stuff starts moving because it's powerful. That's a sign of the kingdom. A new reality that can't be seen yet is marginalized, trivialized, and even mocked. This subversive moving forward and restoration of God's kingdom. Here's another sign of the kingdom, a flash of the kingdom in the lives of people who choose to follow him and obey him. See, whenever you or I chooses God's way instead of our own way, that's a sign of the kingdom. Every time. See, we're missing this stuff, but it's real and it's happening. Whenever someone chooses to repent, believe, and follow Jesus as the king, that is a sign of the kingdom. Whenever we, you and I, reject our right to rule our own deal and choose God's way in any small way, that is a sign of the kingdom because that's a restoration, right? Because you and I are, are hell-bent on our own thing, on our own kingdoms. And when we, choose, when, we choose God's kingdom, when we choose God's way, that's a sign of the kingdom. Something is happening. Something is moving forward. Another sign of the kingdom, when we gather together, when these folks were helping us worship and you were speaking truth and, and sound waves were going out into, into the, the, to the world and you were speaking truth and singing truth, 
that's a sign of the kingdom. When you come, it, when, when, you're, when you're repenting and you're believing and you're speaking those words and you're gathering together in worship, that, that's, that's a powerful thing. When you come together, when you gather together and you choose to serve instead of being served, that's a sign of the kingdom. Because that's, that's subversive. That's counter, that's, that's counter to, to how our... The, the economy of this world and, and how the whole thing works. When we make an effort, when we gather together to know and be known, that's a sign of the kingdom. I kind of mix these two together, but also, you know, like when, when we praise him and give God credit for what he's doing, that's a sign of the kingdom. See, when you sing his praises, you are sending out prophecy uh, vibrations of prophecy that go out. You're saying something that is happening and is going to happen. It's not about you. It's not about me. But that's a sign of the kingdom. Because we don't have the ability to speak truth like that unless God allows us to. Here's another sign of the kingdom. You had no idea there was this many signs of the kingdom. That the kingdom, as a present reality, moving forward, was so in front of our faces healings. What did God say the kingdom was? What, what did we, how do we, it's the restoration of God's rule over all things. That's, that's the physical realm too. So, before sin brought death, our bodies were not intended to, to, to deteriorate. I know that's totally stupid to say because nobody would you know, believe that outside this room. But our bodies, when they were created, were not intended to decay and deteriorate. I mean, just have, have any of you believe that through whatever means God chose to use, that through prayer, yourself, other people, that God healed your body? Just raise your hand if, you, if you've ever experienced that. You believe that was God. Okay. You are signs of the kingdom because your body was not intended to deteriorate. So when God, through whatever means he chooses, heals something in your body, that's a sign of what's going to happen. Now, we all know that that's a sign because even if we're healed, nobody gets out of here alive, right? Until Jesus comes back. But that's a sign of how it's going to be when, when we get our new resurrection bodies and they are perfect like they were supposed to be and they don't deteriorate. So when something happens physically in your body, that, that is a sign of the kingdom of God. That is, that is a sign of the restoration of how things are supposed to be. Where you, where, again, what brought death into the world? Sin, separation from God. It's his authority being stored over everything. That is the physical stuff. Redeeming garbage is a sign of the kingdom. What do I mean by that? When God takes your worst day, your worst decision ever, your biggest screw-up, evil that was perpetrated on you that is not your fault, and he turns that around and makes something good about it, makes something beautiful out of it, that is a sign of the kingdom think about that. Let that land right here and slide down to here. Your worst day, your worst decision, your biggest screw up, the thing that was done to you that was not your fault. You don't have to say any of those things are good. But the kingdom is when he takes that garbage and he makes something good out of it. Makes something amazing out of it. Only God can do that. That's a sign of the kingdom. So if that's part of your story, you are a sign of the kingdom. Your story is a sign of the kingdom. Something that was from the beginning perfect is being restored and is moving forward. When you submitted to Jesus, even if he didn't take it away, and if, even if he didn't prevent it, that is a sign of the kingdom being restored. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, even if God doesn't save us, we're not going to bow. Now, he did, but they said, even if he doesn't. That's a sign of the kingdom. That's in Daniel 3. Check it out. That's what, that's what he's done for me. 
He took the worst day that I've ever had that I can ever imagine having, and he is making something amazing out of it. I don't understand that. I can't even quantify that. I can't even, I can give you some, some handles about that, but I can't, it's hard to express. But that's a sign of the kingdom. The fact that this horribly flawed and broken person can do any of this stuff under the circumstances is a sign of the kingdom. And it's not just about me, it's about you. When did God take your worst day, your worst decision, your biggest screw up, that horrible thing that was done to you, and I want to say it again, that was not your fault, evil perpetrated on you, and God grabbed that and he turned it around and made something amazing. That is the kingdom of God as a present reality. It's a sign of his rule being restored. Isn't that remarkable? Don't you need to praise God for that? I hope that sometime before you leave, you will praise God with somebody and tell them a little bit of your story of how God, how you are a part of the restoration of his kingdom in, on earth as it is in heaven. Helping people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and committed to Jesus' mission, making disciples, is a part of the kingdom. Whenever a disciple is made, whenever somebody is taught to obey Jesus and walked alongside him and helped, that's a sign of the kingdom. Whenever we serve neighbor or the least of these, particularly in ways that, that lead to disciples being made, those are signs of the kingdom. I could go on and on, but we don't have all day. Because there are, there are signs of the kingdom all over the place. But, but can, can we see it? There's, a, there's an old phrase in the church of God that's, you know, probably 100 years old. Can you see the kingdom? We were talking about that before it was cool. I don't know that it's cool yet, but we're working on that. This is part of the gospel. The kingdom is a present reality. It's moving forward and expanding and exists wherever God's loving rule through Christ is acknowledged. If, if, the, if, if, you are, if we're living in a new reality, the kingdom, then we need to be able to see it and experience it. Here's some things, some steps of obedience that you might try so that you can experience living in this new reality. You can get out of the, this is a cute metaphor, to a new reality. Is this a Hallmark card or is this where I live? That's the difference. Here's some steps of obedience to help us experience it. Repeat the phrase, I am one in whom Christ dwells and I live in his unshakable kingdom throughout the next week. I'm going to challenge you to do that. I, 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 sometimes I forget, but I try to feed on that because that's so subversive and countercultural, isn't it? Find a trigger. Yeah, every time I eat something, every time I drink something, every time I go to my locker at school, every, every time I pull out my reading glasses, for those of us who need those now, you know, whatever, what, find a trigger. that, that in use, just, It's a simple phrase. Say it after me. I am one in whom Christ dwells. And I live in his unshakable kingdom. That's who I am and that's where I live. Speak this new reality and then look for it. In a world that looks like everything's fl flying apart and out of control. Here's the second one. Be honest about your issues with authority. I mean, come on. <laughs> we, we have to talk about this, right? Don't, don't we? Because we're Americans. We're, we're autonomous. We're, we're individuals. Now, some of us, this is really hard for because the people that were in authority were either bullies or they were absent. If that's kind of part of your story, I'm not yelling at you here today. I get it. When we start talking about authority, you start twitching because the people that were supposed to be modeling God's loving rule and authority were either bullies or they were absent. They checked out. So all I'm asking you to do, I'm not trying to be Freud or something out of here. All I'm asking you is just to be honest about that and, and, and notice that, okay, that's... If you want to try a different phrase instead of authority, say, aligning your life with the, God, with the kingdom of God. Try that one. But to be honest about that. Because that may be the thing that's holding you up from those three things. Repenting, believing, and following. Because here, why does he have, you may be thinking, why does, he, why does he have to be a king? That's just uncomfortable. Acknowledge where that's coming from. 
He needs to be the king because I need one and because you need one. We don't like to think about it. But if that's you, I just want you to, to consider. Consider that. Here's the next one. Pray the Lord's Prayer for the next seven days, emphasizing your kingdom come. That's in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. The NIV uses, uses that specific language. You just pray that regularly. When you're going, going to sleep, you print it out, have a Bible there, whatever. Put it, pull it up on your phone and read that prayer. See, then you're asking for stuff to start happening around you. Your kingdom come. Make it happen around me what's happening up there where your rule is not, is not challenged at all. Or better, you're, you're in, in praying the, the Lord's Prayer, you're asking the Holy Spirit to give you the ability to see the things that he's doing all around you. Those signs, those flashes of the kingdom. His loving rule being restored over all things. And here's the last one. Just be watchful for signs of the kingdom. Start noticing that stuff that, that God's exploding all around you. See, now that you are speaking about this new reality and praying for it, now anticipate that you're going to see it. You're going to see the restoration of God's rule over everything in front of your face. Tell your brothers and sisters in Christ. Tell your family. Journal it. If you're in a, if you're in a bridge group, tell the people in the bridge group, here's the signs of the kingdom I've seen. See, our eyes are trained to see the kingdoms of this world. That's where we're trained. We can find authority or who's in charge. We go into a room at work or at school, we can figure out who's really in charge there. Because we're, we're wired to see that. But the restoration of, of God's kingdom means now I can see the real kingdom happen. The rule of God being restored. May his kingdom come and his will be done today in us as it is in heaven. That is where the gospel begins and that's where the gospel ends. Let's pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that you, that you are a king and you do have a kingdom. And that wherever we're, however our seat feels this morning, we, we feel like there's chaos in our lives that around us. We see, whenever we look at the television, people falling apart. Things not operating as they should be. But you said to us, seek first my kingdom and live righteously. And then all of these things will be added to you as well. Thank you for your goodness and for your patience as you restore your kingdom so that many may enter. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.